And please ask questions. Mm -hmm. well, I, I hope so. It's a, it's a small group. And, and to speak for an hour and 15 minutes isn't the easiest thing to do if, there, if there's not a discussion. A discussion would be much better. And please don't think you have to save any questions. Like for the end, but I'd rather do them as they come up. Okay, we have to raise our hand. Yeah. Should we raise our hand? Raise your hand, okay. shout, stand right. up. Let's listen to Shelley's introduction. Of course, those are, are you know, basic medical facts. It's good to know that if I'm going to talk to you about medicine, I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's good to know that if we're going to talk about clinical trials and how drugs get approved, that I know something about that. The other thing I'd throw in though is I'm not an addiction medicine specialist. But it's been almost 40 years. I'm an internist. Complex adult disease, hospital medicine, critical care medicine, research medicine. You may notice that it'll give me a bit of a different perspective than, than some of the traditional, old-fashioned addiction medicine docs that sometimes you have to talk with. Title, Medication Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder, was the basic request. But we thought we ought to change that a little. So we've got a second line, other substance use disorders. And by the way, if I drift down to a whisper, somebody tell me, because when I speak up, I feel like it's an argument. Okay. I really, I really do. <laughs> so other yeah, substance use disorders, because I want to touch very briefly on alcohol, and then in some greater extent on methamphetamine. Uh, traditional MAT, opioid use disorder, is important. We're 20 years into that. So we might know some things. Some people may be newer to the subject. I recognize perhaps a third of the people here, but not everyone. But, but meth is a, is a more pressing problem. So we're going to pivot after a while from opioid use disorder to, to meth, okay? okay? Cool. I didn't see that transition from before. Uh, <laughs> okay. I want to really, uh, I want, uh, sorry, to, so, someone say something else. No. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to start with this medication assisted treatment because I want to sort of dispose of two things. One of them is that somebody, people think that as docs, we're saying medication assisted treatment is the treatment and we can cure substance use disorder or opioid use disorder with the medication. So never mind the entire rest of the treatment paradigm, it's just medicine. That's wrong, that's not what anybody thinks or what anybody should think. The name medication assisted treatment, when they made this up, they meant treatment is in behavioral health and mental health. That's what treatment meant to the people who were putting this terminology together. So the medications have been used to assist traditional behavioral health and mental health treatment, not in any way to replace them. And perhaps, because of some of that confusion, they changed the name. So now it's, it's usually called medications for opioid use disorder, which is a bit broader. I don't like the acronyms, so I didn't put out there, mood. Yeah. yeah, mood. So the emphasis on what we do with medications is that it's assisting treatment. It's an impressive four pages of conference material that you have here. It really is covering all kinds of things. Medications are to assist in that, to take a patient who might be, um, even in the court setting, using, relapsing, withdrawing, high, thinking about drugs, unsteady. This is sort of by time with the medications to let some of these other kinds of things work. And even when we have a behavioral health coverage, we very often don't have mental health coverage. <coughs> it's it's got to be there. And then the very last thing, co-occurring, I suppose you use more commonly when talking about mental health disorders, co-occurring with some physical or addiction. But it's really the others. We just mentioned a bit. If you have a pain patient who's been using opioid because they're in significant pain and don't have a doctor that's going to treat that pain, you're not going to succeed. That patient's not going to be able to succeed. And they, they just don't. They're going to, they're, they're in real pain. I'm not talking about a you know a 20 year old who complains they've got back pain when they lift a rock. You know, mm -hmm. many many people have had very serious injuries, serious surgeries, very objective and clear sources of pain. And so treatment is going to have to address that. The same thing: depression, anxiety, attention deficit. Many of these are self-medicated conditions. And we don't want to take it as an excuse. I'm, I'm taking oxys because I have pain. 
seeing a hundred of them a day, do you? Mm -hmm. <coughs> but, they, but they feed in. You can't successfully do the mm -hmm. treatment part without recognizing that these underlying conditions might have been a better word to use also have to be addressed. Yes. Hmm. I want to start with some of the global things. This is one of my favorites. This is from 2014. Uh, dates are in red. I put dates in red because I want people to see how old some of this is. I mean, it's, it's old. There's, no, there's nothing. There's no new discoveries here. Monoclonal antibodies. <coughs> Thanks for all this for coming in. And all I requested is that I get interrupted with questions whenever there is one. Okay? <laughs> Benefits of MAT. I mean, buprenorphine went online in, in, in 2000, maybe 2002, I don't remember. Look what it does. It reduces illness, it reduces death, it reduces overdose death, it reduces transmission of infectious disease, it increases treatment retention which ties into that medication assisted part, that if they're in treatment longer, retaining in treatment longer, you know, a year and a half, and not three visits, you're gonna get a better outcome. Social function and criminal activity. It's almost, what more could anybody want? What, what could you put on that list that's not on there that you would want to uh, be the outcome of any kind of therapy? And that's published in 2014, so you know that's five years of work before that got published. Mm -hmm. How about drug courts? This, these, these, these guys are doing the journal, think this benefit. Drug court system, you probably know that paper, Principles of Drug Abuse, Principle 12, medication is an important part of treatment. I mentioned the, the three that we have now. The last sentence is interesting. Should be made available to individuals who can benefit from them. So we want something really clear, right? There's that report, this principle number 12. Medications are important. And then they throw it in there. Individuals who can benefit from them. So that's the whole decision-making process again. What do you do with that? Who can benefit? I would tend to think, as, as, as an opinion now, that almost everyone benefits because the relapse period is potentially so long. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, well, I haven't relapsed in three weeks. I haven't relapsed in seven months. This, it's long. You say, when would a, when would brain studies, say, uh, how long after the person has last used, the brain studies begin to look normal? Two years. Two to three, two to three mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And psychological tests as well. So even if you use that minimal criteria, everything going perfectly, it's going to be a few years till people turn around. And then you say, well, somebody relapsed after two weeks, bad, but they didn't lose much. What if they relapsed after two years and they lost everything that they've just done? So you make an argument that probably most people should be treated, but then you also want to say, but how? So sometimes people are in the court system or come to our attention a long time after their last use. There was all the legal stuff at the beginning and the, and the decision to go into court and the court. And you may find with your analyses to back it up, somebody might not have used for a year, a little more, a little less. Later on, we'll talk about, well, extended release, no checks on I mentioned that too. We tend to use that for the first year as a relapse prevention medication and step down to oral. But really, if someone hasn't used for a year or more, we're not going to start with the uh, IM injection. We're going to pick it up later on with something else, but we're going to pick it up. So my, my argument there would be individual, who should, you know, available to individuals who can benefit from them, almost everybody, without a contraindication to having the medication. But you also aren't going to do the same thing that people who last used a week ago that you're going to do for somebody who last used a year and a half ago. What are the contraindications? The, the easiest contraindication to any of them is an allergic reaction or an intolerance to it. But then you do, you do get some others, um, especially with Vivitrol, extended release naltrexone, not approved for pregnancy. They haven't shown them any harm in pregnancy, but they haven't tested it. So you try to stay away from things like that. And um, also people with severe liver disease. Uh, and we've got those because we've got, we've got the chronic hepatitis, chronic active persistent hepatitis. 
So those are, those are the main contraindications, allergy, intolerance, um, pregnancy, and liver disease. You're welcome for asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I, I, you know, if it was a different kind of thing, I'd say, okay, you're next. <laughs> so let's get to keep the questions. So finally, let's get to the medicines. This is, this is uh, CDC defined right off their webpage, the three that are considered, officially considered, FDA indicated, treatment for opioid use disorder, methadone since the 60s, buprenorphine since around 2000, naltrexone probably since around 2010, 2012. I don't like the CDC webpage there either. I'll object to a sentence too, just like I did on the, the other thing. Sometimes in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies, that sometimes is against everything that I've said so far this morning. It can't be sometimes. It's got to be all the time. So I have a question. Um, we had a, a we screened a, a client for one of the other courts, and um, it came up. The question came up: How long has he been on methadone? What's his dosage? And is he in compliance? As a precursor for a decision to be made for him coming in into the court, and I don't know if that's necessary. If they're on methadone, they're being provided, or if they're getting their services through a, of an agency. Does that matter? As far as would that be screening criteria to come in? So, so uh, it's going to be a split answer again, which, which by the way, is why it's good to have a lot of experience in this field. And that's not the way. That's not what I wanted to say. I was going to say why it may be necessary to be clever sometimes, mm -hmm. but that sounded arrogant. <laughs> but, 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 but still, it's, it's, it's true. Methadone is a long-standing drug, 64, I think, or 62. I'll have a slide later. It's not a good choice. And it, 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 there's a time when it was. If you could think back to the 60s, opiates meant heroin. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't pills. They weren't effects on oil heroin. And methadone was called methadone maintenance programs. So the idea was, instead of going to get your dirty needle and heroin, you would go get methadone. And, and as a methadone maintenance harm mitigation strategy, it was certainly helpful. Why is it? shouldn't be bothering me about anything that I'm obliged to check. So now, what are the disadvantages of methadone now, especially because you want a person to succeed in the program? Well, they, they've got to go get it six days a week, right? That's one disadvantage of it. So people in core systems have enough to do. Now you're going to go six days a week to get that. It's not usually going to be close. Uh, and there are only four of them in Montana and in the larger cities. The other, the other thing, regardless of the logistical part, Personally, I think it's a dead end. They never taper. They never try to taper. They're just on methadone for the rest of their life. Yeah. Then the, the other the, the other bad part of that is while they're in court, any other program, you check in on your scene, and you're doing your analyses. You know, you know, you, you know they're on methadone. They're on methadone. They're coming out of the court program, and all they have for treatment is methadone. You know, the relapse potential is still pretty high for people who don't want to drive two hours each way, six days a week. And since the, 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 there's no attempt on the methadone maintenance program, methadone maintenance, there's no attempt to minimize or eliminate that dose. And it's, and it's, it's a full-blown opioid with all the opioid effects that well, heroin and methadone have. So in, in, I, un, I understand it. I would compliment the people who started it. Uh, it's, it's probably the worst choice now. So what we get is people coming into a court program on methadone. The court doesn't want them on methadone. The patient is sick of going for methadone too, for that matter. You can't just stop it though. So most of the patients we tend to admit to inpatient for medically supervised withdrawal. It, it works very well. It's getting harder to do. I used to have people go to Peabury, Phillipsburg, because it was a small, quiet hospital. Their whole administration is in turmoil. They don't have enough nurses. Um, I feel if it's going to be a inpatient, even though our mid-level staff can do what I like to be right there. Yeah. That's a, that's a part of the program we're going to have to strengthen because there's increasing need for it. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you
especially people coming with methadone, I would really make a case for moving them off. If they say they've done great and they don't want to move off, well, it's fair. Yeah. It's fair. You know. But it, it should not be for a team to decide that's a preclusion for coming into the court. I, I agree with you, yes. Yeah, but if, they're on, if they're on methadone, it's not like they're saying, I'm coming into the court and damn right I'm taking my heroin. Right, right, yeah. right. Right, if they're on a methadone mm -hmm. program, they're getting, they're getting an uh, MAT. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think you should preclude them coming into court. Yes. From another perspective, there are just better ways to treat them. You said you use the hospital in Phillipsburg, and is that what, so you can be there at it? Is it uh, uh, why Phillipsburg? Well, you said it was a small hospital, but, but then you said that you like to be there. Oh, I was thinking some of the some of the logistical barriers to admitting people. Phillipsburg is a small hospital, and I'm an anaconda, and when there's a pain, I can get to Phillipsburg, but if um, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks next month, I don't like people in the hospital if I'm not going to be there because the various mid-level providers we have, the mental health nurse practitioners, the regular nurse practitioners, they don't have the inpatient experience. So I feel much more comfortable admitting a patient when I know I'm going to be physically available. Have you ever used pass passageways or up in Kalisville for your detox? Well, I, I know the name, but most of those places are not able to detox from uh, full blown opioids. You know, there's there's a kind of detox that's I don't know what to call it, low level. You know, maybe some medications, maybe some benzodiazepine. The, the, the people coming in with the sort of detox we do from methadone, from heroin, they're usually 10-day admissions, and some of them will, will, will not do well. So it's really meant to be a, a hospital-based. Not everybody, people can go to pathways. There are people who can do outpatient withdrawal. But the, the heavier users, you know, the 100 milligrams a day of methadone, you know, the, the five points three times a day heroin, they're going to need some more support as a well. rule. Otherwise, the taper would take years to get off some of those high doses. Yeah, and they also usually reach a floor where they just can't go below it. They just can't go below it. Right. Yeah. Okay. What have we got here? Wow. I want to I hit on each of the drugs fairly quickly. And methadone, we've spoken a bunch about it, pill or liquid. They're only dispensed at, at um, opiate treatment program sites. It's another FD, it's another conundrum because you can provide methadone from your office for pain. I want to give you, people can peek and say, here's 100 milligrams of methadone, no problem. But you know, give you 20 milligrams of methadone to help with a um, addiction maintenance issue, you can't do it from the office. Um, the medication, of course, is very euphoric, very hedonic, very high risk for abuse. It's, it's only certified in, not uh, dispensed in person, which is really quite a burden if you don't have to happen to live next door to it. And that would have been different in 1960, whatever, because unfortunately a lot of the people were, you know, traveling to some horrible place in the city to get the heroin anyway. Mm -hmm. They might as well go to a place where they're going to get methadone. And it's, it's kinder and, it's, and it's, it's better for them. But the paradigms have changed. That's it for the methadone for the moment. Even buprenorphine is, is, I think that's 20 <coughs> years now. You know, it's an awfully long time that these medicines were available to still be having um, quite as much difficulty picking up utilization. It comes to subutex. It's, uh, which is just buprenorphine. Suboxone is buprenorphine plus something that they call naloxone that um, keeps you from injecting it. Just suboxone buprenorphine can be injected. Somebody could get high from that. You know, they don't much. It's way more expensive and harder to get than heroin. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, most people, what's the, what's the point? But it's possible they could inject it, get high from it, so there's no being antagonist in there, naloxone, so they can't inject it. I, it doesn't make anybody feel high. It, um, I shouldn't say anybody. Somebody who's never had an opioid kid, totally opioid naive, they'll probably feel something. But people who are used to opioids are not going to feel high, euphoric, hedonic from buprenorphine. You know, they may have lived with a 
methadone. Methadone keeps feeding that. You can't leave the buprenorphine. It doesn't. Office space prescribing, extra training. But as usual, if you wanted to give it in the office for pain, you wouldn't need an extra waiver or training. It's, it's just, you know, you're talking about barriers to doing this. Well, there, there's one. So can you get a high from buprenorphine if you're in addition to your MAP program, you're also getting a second source on the street. Because we've just had a few cases where we've heard reports that people who are on a MAP program have been getting strips off the street and using them in addition. They shouldn't be. And yeah, I'm sorry, I don't think it shouldn't be. In moral sense, you wouldn't expect they'd be able to get higher and higher dose. Okay. Because if the, the, the dose and the metabolism peaks out. But you never know. I'm medical director for Job Corps, and I come to Job Corps. And they snort ibuprofen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I really am not picking that up. And various other things. So you don't know what somebody's going to say. But the realistically <coughs> study purposes, even increasing that dose. By the time you're on three films, 24 milligrams, you've supersaturated all the available receptors. You have somebody wanting 10 million who's going to feel better, or thinks they feel better, like placebo effect, possible. I don't want to forget to mention supplicate at the end there, which is the subcutaneous injection. You may very well have a patient with buprenorphine as the correct med medication. Perhaps the patrol isn't good. They have liver disease. They're pregnant. They're intolerant. Whatever. So you're losing the Vivitrol coverage for alcohol and methamphetamine, but you still have to do something for the opioids, and you have someone who's not been compliant for whatever reason. They take too much, they take too little. You can partly get around that by using the injection once a month. So Suboxone, um, <clears throat> can it be inappropriately used by injection and they get a high from that? Subutex, which is just buprenorphine, can give somebody a high from injection, different than the oral, different than the oral um, absorption, because of course much more of it is available. But subutex by itself is rarely used. It's usually used in combination with naloxone, and it's called uh, suboxone. And the naloxone doesn't get absorbed orally. So even though they're taking the buprenorphine orally and the naloxone orally doesn't get absorbed, but it blocks it on injection. It's Narcan. It's basically what you give somebody. Please. We had someone come into our court and say, um, hey, we'll, we'll, I'm willing to be on subutex, but no suboxone because I'm allergic to the naloxone. So I'll only take the subutex. Um, we, you know, call us paranoid cynical but we kind of smelled a fish does that sound accurate to you or, you or know, do you it, think it, uh, it does you know I'm, I'm sure there are some people with documented allergies to naloxone i'm so worried when it gets to naloxone naloxone or fixone will we'll mess me up sometimes they probably are why not mm -hmm. right. you don't know, wait waiting enough time but more often than not we don't we don't buy it yeah um or, or there's no documentation so really, well, let's have you take it now. All right, I'll watch you. All right, good. right. I've got my epinephrine, all right? Right. But let's say they really do insist. They insist maybe it's not unreasonable. That's the that's reason we can switch over to supplicate. Because mm -hmm. we're not going to give them subutex. Mm -hmm. uh, Medicaid and most payers simply won't pay mm -hmm. the subutex mm -hmm. unless the patient ended up in the ER with an with a yeah. allergic reaction. Um, so that's, that's another way to go. One helpful. thing to keep in mind is that supplicate is equivalent to about one buprenorphine film, about eight milligrams. Okay. Yeah, so if somebody is, you know, really needs three because they're really cute, you know, they're you know, just shooting heroin last week, smoking fentanyl, mm -hmm. they're going to need a higher dose. We'll have to get by somehow before we can't just put them on supplicate. Um, you can always find out something to do for a few weeks. Very helpful, thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, the same thing with Vivitrol. 
when people don't want Vivitrol shots, mm -hmm. they'll come up with something. Mm -hmm. and to, to, here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story. A woman says she can't take her Vivitrol because it makes her feel like she's got a hangover. I said, all right, how long does that last? An hour or two? Okay, how many days? A day or two. So, so when, you, when you take meth, you don't get any kind of <laughs> hangover? She says, sure I do, but then I take more meth. <clears throat> when, when we, uh, yeah, I end up saying that. Explain that to you, George, would you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Perfect. So, I, I mean, I don't have any medical training, and so I've uh, struggled sometimes with like, these different drugs and like what, what you're seeing from the participants in terms of um, like effects of the drugs, what that should look like. And so, specifically, the buprenorphine type ones, what are, what are you seeing in terms of like reasonable side effects? Like what, what's, what's the drug and what's other stuff? You know, to, to make it partly easy, with almost all of these medicines, it's other stuff. <laughs> you know, it, it really is. But you're going to find the list. When, 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 um, and, I'm, and when we start people on naltrexone, Vivitrol, they get nauseous, so we give them, before their first shot, we give them medication for nausea. They'll get a headache, they'll get ibuprofen. But in terms of serious side effects, they're relatively safe medications to use. But you do get the side effects that come from resistance to wanting to have it. Yeah, I agree to take the medicine because I want to be in the program and I don't want to be incarcerated, but they don't really want it. You know, one of them, a, a woman, said she, pa she, she passed out as soon as she got the needle. The nurse said, I never put the needle in her. <laughs> you know, it's, it's stuff like that. See, yeah. you know, or the, 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 the thing that I just said with the, with the, with the Vivitrol. Yeah, she gets a hangover from meth, but she can take more meth. But she can't take more Vivitrol. So <laughs> you get these little conundrum things, and usually you end up saying, well, then don't be in the program. And that's, that's what we, yeah. we were, we've had that happen where, well, I need to do some research on this Vivitrol. Like, did you do research on the meth that you shot up? Or the heroin that you got from the guy in the alley? You know? And it's, so I need to do some research. We'll we'll find, we get that out. I also didn't, uh, there's more to your question, though, because we spend you know, a lot of time on sure. it. Because all the medicines will have minor side effects reported. They, they're fairly safe, so they don't have major side effects reported. There's a rare exception. Can I share something briefly? Please. Um, on our team, when we first started, we would sit in our staffings like, you know, meeting of a self-appointed physician. <laughs> and we'd decide what medications they could take, what they could, and what would work for them. Then we'd decide, you know, uh, what levels were their your analysis, what level were they, was there math? We'd look at those. And we decided at some point that, that all of that's out of our lane. And when we went with Dr. Ryder in a MAP program, it's funny, because the more we talked about medications and stuff in staffing, the more they talked about it. It was like this huge preoccupation for our court. When we went with Dr. Ryder, now if they stand up there and say, oh my god, my, oh, my butt hurts so bad from that injection. Say, oh, talk to Dr. Ryder. Yep. It's the end of it. Yep. We don't talk about it in staffing. It's not our place or our lane. We don't, you know, it's nice to have the education that, that we get on these medications, but it's not important for us to know much about them, honestly, because it's not our deal, right? Yep. Um, it has helped us tremendously to let that be your piece. And to further actually delve into your question, because again, it's important. Everything we treat people for is, is based on a risk-benefit ratio. So you might mm -hmm. say, what, what, it's, oh, is a headache an important side effect? Sure, if, if there's like nothing wrong with you but a hangnail. You know, if you, if you get a rash from ibuprofen, don't take the ibuprofen for the hangnail. But most of the people we're dealing with here, are, these are all potentially terminal illnesses. Mm -hmm. So if someone asks, does not have a major side effect resulting in hospitalization or death from the medication, the minor stuff, we just say, well, the, the, the ones that say they can't have an injection but have no single place left to inject. <coughs> yeah. You know, yeah. 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 so we, we get those. Mm -hmm. That's a blend of real side effects and people trying to push the idea of side effects so they can get away from the treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like they went backwards just pressing this thing. Does it impair somebody so they like from driving? Mm -hmm. um, Methadone. It's, it's, the short answer is no because once they've been on them for a while. Mm -hmm. So when you're just starting somebody, 
on buprenorphine. I don't think I've ever started out. Well, I start paying patients on methadone. You always tell them, you know, uh, start less, you know, I'm prescribing one, start at a half. Don't, don't do it till Friday, still so home on the weekend. So once somebody's gotten used to the medicine, they don't. Uh, but thank goodness for the methadone people, because they're all driving for hours to get it. Mm -hmm. So the main possibly you would be careful with it at the beginning. So are the main positive effects then just avoiding withdrawal and cravings, or are there other? I mean, if they're not getting the same before high like methadone, is it mostly just avoiding the impacts of withdrawal from heroin at that point? On, on with methadone is the med? No, no, on uh, like suboxone. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, what, so if you kind of go, so, so you kind of, it's going to be dependent to kind of where you're picking them up in the course of things. But if someone's coming in and they're actively using heroin or some other opioid, when you, when you give them buprenorphine, they will stop, it will, it will uh, uh, attenuate their withdrawal symptoms, attenuate their cravings, and reduce their chance of relapse. Right. But without the same high that methadone has. That, that, that's right. Now, methadone, they may not get much of a high anymore either when they've been on it for so many years. But there's still the, a potential for methadone. It's not. It's really not a potential for those other medications with a reason. So the, the buprenorphine person after three years is going to be on almost no buprenorphine. We'll hit that up a bit later too. The methadone person on three years is going to be on every bit or more as they started with. Because you get tolerance to methadone, you don't get tolerance to buprenorphine. Thanks. So look, you know, we did talk about that one. So I, I complimented 1964 methadone, suggested it's not the most helpful thing to be using today. Buprenorphine is an excellent medicine, except that there is so much overlap between alcohol, opioids, and meth. There are probably better choices than buprenorphine for a lot of people. Right? And diversion is an issue. Yeah. People sell it on the street and say, well, well, why is it that such a high street price if it's not making them high? Because it keeps them from withdrawing. So if they can't get heroin or whatever else they may want to get, and they can get some suboxone, some subs, at least it'll cover the withdrawal part until they can get what they want. So that's its, that's its street value. Mm. And supplicating, we, we end up having um, Compliance difficulties. Naltrexone, we're going to spend a lot more time on Naltrexone. Vivitrol is extended release Naltrexone, it just means it's a monthly injection. It's not FDA approved, FDA, I'm oh, sorry, the water. Oral Naltrexone is not FDA approved for opiate use disorder. So, since there's such an emphasis on only using things that are FDA approved, a concept that I will viciously attack later. <laughs> the Medicaid will, will sometimes say, hey, you haven't tried oral. So, so, so now you're telling me that I should try the non-FDA approved approach, are you? <sighs> but it's not approved for oral. It's approved for IM. You know, why would it work IM instead of oral? Because it gives a much higher sustained level. You know, pills, unless you, you can take the pill every hour to get a sustained level, but you can't give them every hour, it's too much. So you get a higher sustained level with with um, an injection. Uh, no euphoria, not hedonic. Every bit as effective as buprenorphine. There are no withdrawal issues. There are no um, diversion issues. It's a, it's a relatively benign medicine except for actually getting the injection. And guess what? It can be really effective in treating methamphetamine addiction. I can't overemphasize the point that much. We used to have people, um, sir, please. So why would you use the boxone? I mean, why wouldn't you just use the naltrexone if it works as well and there's no opiate on board? Why would anyone bother with the boxone? For relapse prevention, uh -huh. by naltrexone is our drug of choice. Okay. It's, it's actually our, our, our drug of choice if we could use it. So the contraindications. You know, uh, we said pregnancy, liver disease, true allergy. But so it really is naltrexone is your go-to, not suboxone? As long as it's relapse prevention. Well, the distinction there is you can't use Vivitrol on someone who's high. No, I if that opened it up system, we need that 10 days. Now, that also, by the way, that takes us back to the hospital question a bit. Mm -hmm. 
But most of these people could stay off an opioid for 10 days, they just would. Yeah. But you guys know that they don't or they can't. Um, some, sometimes they can, rarely. You know, not a, you're not a really severe user. You give them a lot of support at home. Sometimes they can, but they just usually can't. So if they're going to make the transition from methadone, from street drugs, methadone, or buprenorphine to Vivitrol, which we think is a better drug for a lot of reasons, uh, they are going to um, need help. Yeah. And it occurs to me that I should say right then and there that I don't own Al Kermis <laughs> manufacturer of Vivitrol. Uh -huh. Not even a little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I suppose the closures do make sense because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the guys do. Yeah. Uh, we don't even go for it. It's all done by third party. Did that help clear up that question? Yeah. It's yeah. So, much so if someone's been us. using heavy doses, then you're going to need to give them some opiate. But if they've been, again, if it's been three or four months, but you know that they're, they're that two-year risk of relapse still, but they've been off, somehow, they maybe they've been in jail for three months, then then there'd be no point in going back to something with an opiate, you'd be much better off with something like naltrexone, which no, which has no street value. We, 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 our group, my friends, believe this strongly. Mm -hmm. there, there are other things, partly because, which we'll get into, let me just check my, no, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> Vivitrol is not FDA approved for methamphetamine use disorder. It is for opioid use disorder, so we've got it there. It's not approved for methamphetamine use disorder. Who cares that it's not approved for methamphetamine use disorder? I said I will violently attack mm -hmm. that concept. We'll get to it. <laughs> now, I want to come back to some of these slides, too. Now, now it's 2016, 2014, MAT helped all these things. Everything from criminality to death and, and relapse. Now it's 2016 and they're going on about Surgeon General, well supported scientific evidence can be effective, underutilized. It's a long time, it's getting to be a long time. Mm -hmm. All right, well, what did we say before? I've already, it's 2022, wasn't it, for buprenorphine? Oh, well, this goes the wrong way. 20, 2002 for buprenorphine, the 20 years. Yeah. Underutilized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder though. Y yes, it's underutilized. But whose fault is that, so to speak? FDA. So to speak. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not you guys. You're, you're working hard at it. So I'll get back to that too. Well, they say it's not used in an insufficient number of existing treatment programs. Well, how would it be? Most treatment programs don't have docs associated. They might have a medical director or somebody who examines a patient on the way in, you know, for their general medical things, but they don't usually have a treating physician to deal with addiction. So of course it's not equal us. There's nobody to prescribe it. Well, like you said, when you guys brought it to mind to hear, it, nobody was interested in it. So people have, we have to change people's opinion or awareness so that they can see the benefit before they're, you know, be calling and asking for that in the writer. In, in, the, in the programs. And then the second part is insufficient number of practicing physicians. Well, the more barriers they put up to a practicing physician practicing it, the fewer people go on to do it. You know, it's not just the um, extra training, eight hours extra training to get the waiver, they call it, to prescribe you pretty often. So you put it on during an extended dinner, fine. Yeah. But you're also signing that the FDA is the right to come in and kind of conclude an audit with no notice. So when you're signing for that, it's not just the training, but basically you're giving up any process right. And some people are like, why bother with that? Most docs are busy. I would add to that that for mid-levels, it's 24 hours of training. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, would you please say that again? For mid-levels, it's 24, 24 hours. And the DEA does come visit, and they're not pleasant. It's not an enjoyable experience. You know, I, I would say the same thing. <coughs> Back in those research studies that, that, that um, Michelle mentioned, one, one time in Miami, DEA comes in, and they've got big guns. I mean, big ones. So the podcast comes in, what do you think? Oh, well, we usually inspect meat packing plants. That's why they're armed. 
Oh. So, good. I'm sure you can understand everything we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to say that. Uh, and an anaconda who is different. A guy comes in, our nurse had gotten all the charts ready. There weren't that many. They were thin. And then when the guy came, she couldn't find any of them. And he was looking at her like, you know, come on, lady, sort of thing. He put all his briefcase and paperwork down on her charts. So by the time that actually came to be, this little nurse reaches up to this tall agent and grabs him around the neck. She says, That's not going to come out well, but they never said anything. <laughs> so, right, if they have audits, but if you do your stuff, okay, so what? Mm -hmm. 2017 is the same thing. Un yep, very good, underutilized. This is a long slide. I, I, I've used it before. It's 2018. I've seen it enough times that it doesn't make me tear up anymore. But this, this teenager, just read it. You can see that all. Can you see it from that? wasn't the same objections that you got 20 years ago. Montana article. We get this a lot. Throwing a drug at a drug to fix the problem is ridiculous. And I said, well, why is that in any way ridiculous? I mean, in one case, you have an illegal street drug with high potential for fatality and all the things that follow from it. And in the other case, you have a legal drug that's relatively safe and that gives you an opportunity to engage in all the other treatment modalities. So I don't, I don't even begin to see this, uh, ex except as turf protection. Mm -hmm. 20 years of it now. Here's another one. This is partly true. You can't use buprenorphine because providers put them on three films a day, 24 milligrams, and never taper it. Well, that's not really true. Uh, doubtless there are people who do that. There are people who don't practice their discipline very well in every circumstance. But for the most part, people are on the highest dose in our practice for uh, fewer than six months, and then they start to move down. And they're under one relatively quickly, and then move down to sometimes a quarter of a film, two milligrams. And it's sometimes hard to get them past two milligrams. So if you want to say somebody is going to be on buprenorphine for treatment for life, it may well be, but do you mean 24 milligrams and $1,000 a month? Or do you mean 2 milligrams and pocket change? I got a question for you, Doc. Sure. Um, does supplicate or bup have the same antagonistic effect uh, like it does with heroin um, with, say, fentanyl, more of a truly synthetic as it compared to the semi-synthetic heroin? They work well against both. Good. Yeah, so in terms of the way they work, um, you just put, you want to put fentanyl in with the other opioids. Okay. Okay, now that's not exactly true because you, you may not be detecting fentanyl on um, certain kinds of routine drug screening. Right. You know, different methods. It may or may not come up with opioids. You know, may, may need separate testing. And then you're also getting fentanyl where you don't think there's an opioid. You know, you think you're dealing with a meth patient or a cocaine patient, and then what's not quite going well here? It, this uh, coke is laced with fentanyl. So, so you, you see withdrawal patterns that you're not expecting to see. So it's, it's like an opioid, it is an opioid, like an opioid in the way it's treated, except it's often part of things we wouldn't expect an opioid to be. And the drug tests, 
may show an opioid, but they may not be your fentanyl. Great. I've used this graph before and stopped in 2017 just because I stopped doing it. But everybody comes down on buprenorphine. For There's no one, no one in the practice that's not a pain patient that maintains high doses of buprenorphine. It also helps with anti-diversion because if you've got a quarter of a film a day to work on instead of three, you're not as likely to give it up. Sure. One slide, should have broken this up, but the point is really in the, in the first paragraph, you get criticized. And you get this for sure in courts. Somebody comes in with opioids, they're on buprenorphine. The UAs are fine. There are no more opioids in the UAs, but then meth starts popping up. The, the point here is, or, or the criticism is, <coughs> now your patient's on meth, but you're still going to treat them for opioids? Well, yeah, we're, we're going to still treat them for opioids. We've got, if you have diabetes and hypertension, you're going to treat them for diabetes and hypertension. Well, and it's kind of part for the course with addicts. They want to be food altered, so. And that's a, you know, a really important thing, mm -hmm. that it's not substance specific. We, I wasn't really thinking about this. I told you I'm not an expert in this field, but we see a lot of people come into good control with the opioids, and then you know six months, eight months later, meth starts showing up. Compulsion? Because it's the substance use disorder mm -hmm. is not substance specific. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone that comes up with um, a different substance in the UA or the treatment for one, you expand treatment to the other substance as best you can. You don't tell them that you failed, you're kicked out, you're done. treatment planning, we kind of covered some of the questions at the beginning. You really want to decide what you're doing. Am I getting a call from someone who says this patient is in my office, came for a counseling appointment, they have a needle stuck in their arm. Is this going to be a different treatment approach than someone who hasn't used for six months or a year? So like we discussed earlier, we have one end and one side, we have acute use. We want this person to get assistance in withdrawing from heroin, buprenorphine, assistance in craving buprenorphine, um, certainly relapse prevention, buprenorphine, or enough time to get them off that until we can move them on to their control. Or if someone hasn't been using for a long time, withdrawal. So there's the medication choice. We'll, we have three of them, we'll discard the first one. We use the second one for acute circumstances or if a person can't tolerate Extended release no checksum, which is fit and fall. Then there's no checksum. We're going to have discussions about the date and how long the treatment will be and how we're going to taper it. And for you, pre for an anti diversion, behavioral health, mental health. I do these quickly because this isn't going to be the same for 20 years. Um, and these are also good if anybody has a question, well, this patient in this circumstance, what would you do? I can do that. Why mm -hmm. do do that? Instead of taking an hour for the general, you know, the general stuff. Are there any MAT initiation questions as long as I made that offer? All right. I I'm sorry, I'm sorry to ask you. Oh, nope. <laughs> okay. I had an overly short haircut yesterday. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I was uh, stunned when I turned down the hotel room, bathroom mirror. You know, ten uh -huh. times brighter than the one you have at home. Who's this? Who's this guy? Okay, we're going to start. We're going to begin to pivot to methamphetamine, right? We are mostly seeing people with opioid use disorder, mostly getting buprenorphine. Uh, uh, Jeff Kushner asked us to. And I'll back up on that story. I was at least three meetings, three statewide meetings. Uh, where Jeff stood up each time and asked if anybody would be willing to help uh, uh, to treat methamphetamine patients and been having some good luck with Vivitrol. And nobody, first time, nobody the second time. By the time I mentioned the third time, I was just curious, because this is, this is your court in Billings. There are more docs in Billings than anyplace else in Montana. What's the issue? 
Well, there was an issue. But when I look at your 2021 report, you must know what I mean, for what I mean, state drug court, mm -hmm. the long title, Drugs of Choice. I guess it's not surprising. I didn't think of alcohol as being the number one substance use issue in courts as, as a particular substance. Just, I just didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we're dealing with meth and opioids, somehow you don't think about alcohol. It's just like, all right. And opioids, what we were using. Now, this is combined, you remember, primary and secondary choices. Uh, but still, primary and secondary choices on opioids is 15% out of your report. And a big jump to meth, 41%. This is also what we were saying earlier. People are going up and down across that spectrum. You might treat one, you're going to get the others, which is why Vivitrol, at least in terms of what we have available now, tends to be our first choice medication if we can engage it. This gave us another interesting bit of information. We talked about underutilized, right? We talked about principle 12, drug courts, standards say they should use it. When we looked at this, we said, you know, because you had your top numbers in there about how many people you saw. So if there are 15% of that number on opioids, we're probably seeing half of them. And so if we're seeing, we're seeing half of the patients in a program, that is way better than the single digit results you're getting in most other programs. You know, 1%, 2%, 50% is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't entirely stay that way because we looked at distribution. And so about the 50% of patients that were coming in, of the total opioid patients, about the 50% that were coming in, were coming in from about 50% of the courts. Hmm. So we had a number of courts who were, who were engaging in MAT for most of their relevant populations and others that weren't. So, so the initial excitement about 50% attenuated a bit when it was 50% and 50% of the 50% of the population and 50% of the courts. I think I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then, of course, there's, there's methamphetamine, which is the worst. I don't know, probably methamphetamine, if you just think of what's going on across society for us here, it could well be meth. So now I want to talk about medications for alcohol and meth, other substance use disorders, as promised. Then go to alcohol sec for a moment. It, it, the point about alcohol is that um, some of the people involved with the systems are making a point of saying that we're not addressing outpatient alcohol withdrawal of people coming into the court systems. So they're, they're, they're coming in, they're alcoholics, you know, they're not flagrantly drunk in front of the judge on that day but you want them to go into treatment programs and they don't, or they don't show up because we're overlooking the fact that they don't want to go through withdrawal. They don't want to go through alcohol withdrawal. And if that's not recognized as a barrier, well, then it's not recognized as a barrier and people don't do well, we have gabapentinists that we tend to use for ambulatory alcohol withdrawal. Um, not FDA approved for that indication. It does extremely well. Uh, sometimes backed up with, with um, a little benzo or something. And we also have an algorithm of who can safely be attempted as ambulatory withdrawal and who really should go into the hospital. It's 80% ambulatory. So I wanted to mention that. I think I already mentioned that it's a sort of special case. It's like an opioid in every other way, except that it's mixed in with stuff that isn't opioids. So you know, why is this coke patient seem to be an opioid withdrawal because it was the fed bonus coke. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to methamphetamine, okay? Earlier slides said the same thing. I right? made the statement that methamphetamine can be effectively treated with naltrexone. Well, it's not FDA approved for the indication. Mm -hmm. we, keep, we keep hearing this, right? Let's, let's move on. Article stat news comes every day. Ongoing studies of monoclonal antibodies directed against meth may offer new treatment potential. Monoclonal antibody is an antibody produced by a single clone of cells against something. So those cells make an antibody against the methamphetamine molecule. 
So when it's bound to that antibody, it can't get absorbed into cells. Um, we, used to, we used to use that, um, you may dig, <laughs> digitalis, digoxin, for, for cardiac problems, which hasn't been used in decades. It was a monoclonal antibody for toxicity. So if somebody in an overdose of dig, you can give them a monoclonal antibody. So in meth, you can give them a monoclonal antibody. It has the benefit of pulling it out of the system as well as blocking its use. So it might actually be helpful for acute off the wall method intoxication. Mm -hmm. But then there's a second part of that same article, which is what saves Sands rage at the live nut. They're quoting a doc there. Methamphetamine overdose. No FDA approved meds. And that's hope. Probably the turkey sandwich, some resources, and send them on their way. The guy probably is expressing frustration more than just you know hard heartedness. And he's giving them a turkey sandwich, so we got the compassion in there. But this this makes me furious because you don't need an FDA approval to treat a patient with a medication that's approved for some other purpose. Does that sound strange? Mm. And then do you do you get that? You know, but you, do, you do need a good good reason to do that. Exactly. So that's what that's what we're going to go on. That's what we're going to go on to. You need a good reason to do it. What does FDA approval mean? People think that that sort of FDA approval means you can or can't use a medication. And that isn't what it means. FDA approval is a marketing approval. It's not a medical or scientific approval. It's a marketing approval. And FDA says that a company can put this medicine on the market with a label saying such and such. And that's what it means. It's based on scientific evidence. And it's really important for safety concerns. Because here you do have this medicine for a particular reason, and it's done extensive studies, and at least it's not killing people. So the FDA approval and then the, is, is important for safety reasons. And of course, if you're going to prescribe something, it has to be in a pharmacy to prescribe it, and you have to have FDA approval to get it there. But not necessarily to use it. Can I say something real quick? Sure. I just know I pick up the Vivitrol every week for or month for my for the Matt clients at New Day, and um, when they said that the uh, Vivitrol is like fifteen hundred dollars a pop, right? It's it's very expensive. Medicaid pays for it. But when they say that the naltrexone isn't FDA approved to treat, which is what like a peanuts compared to the Vivitrol expense, that to me just doesn't make sense. They're like it's not FDA approved. But yet, they don't want to push the Vivitrol until they've tried the naltrexone. So it's just this. It, it, it doesn't get it doesn't, sense. Yeah, it's, it's so, frustrating. So these, are, these are economic. Uh, these, are, these are committee economic things. And they, they never make sense. Yeah. And there's some line of a song about how quickly someone will fight to prove that he does not know so. Right. And that's like Medicaid. Yeah. FDA approval is marketing approval. If the drug is on the market for any reason, you can use it for any reason. And second from the last, responsible prescribers who want to use it according to scientific evidence. How many prescriptions are, are off label? Um, you know, my sort of a crank saying it's okay to use off label. About 20% of all prescriptions are in the United States for off-label uses of the medication being prescribed. That's a, that's a lot. This isn't, this isn't a little odd, semi-loophole kind of thing. This is, this is standard practice to use meds. They're not FDA for, for something that's come up as a use that wasn't part of the initial FDA approval. The initial FDA approval is for safety. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave it with my, my saying that methamphetamine can be effectively treated with extended release vivitrol without producing at least a bit of the evidence, just a bit. Because there, there are probably 200 studies I could put up there. But the, the preponderance of studies on naltrexone, even oral naltrexone, um, and, and vivitrol suggested it's uh, effective for the treatment of that. I don't know that I necessarily want to go through these in detail with you. You probably wouldn't want me to. But especially, it's probably it's hard to see the titles towards the back. Effective naltrexone on subjective response to methamphetamine in a clinical sample. A double-blind placebo-controlled laboratory study. 
And here, I put in the oral methotrexone, uh, sorry, the oral methotrexone papers too, because we follow up the IM with oral. So where did that come from? It's not FDA approved for use. So, so we want to use IM, Vivitrol, for methamphetamine, it's not approved for use. And we want to use oral naltrexone as part of that staging of the, of the whole treatment course. Because it's all based on data. The second one, naltrexone moderates the relationship between Q-induced craving and subjective response to methamphetamine in individuals with methamphetamine use disorder. Significantly reduced association between Q and use craving, positive subject response. Third one is about the same. Naltrexone for treatment of methamphetamine, randomized placebo controlled. Randomized placebo controlled means we, we, if we could put together our job, our uh, drug core data, and publish some of that, but it's not randomized, it's not controlled, it's very anecdotal, it's not a tight study. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't get conclusions that you can really rest on on studies like that, so the gold standard is. Yokes, um, randomized placebo control trials. 12 weeks, not checked on the Oh, 65% of the people in 12 weeks were negative on the ways, placebo 47%. Is that a big difference, 65, 47? No, it isn't. Isn't, it isn't a really big difference. But this is 50 milligrams of oral naltrexone. So that's like next to nothing. And people in these studies didn't have any other support. Okay? Okay. So there's a, there's a, there's a big, 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 big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one, though, that's Vivitrol. Effects of naltrexone, XR, large scale network interaction and methamphetamine use. Days of MA use to decrease from five to one and a half. Well, that's that's big. That's not sixty percent to forty percent. That's five to one and a half. And again, <coughs> these these are drug trials. They're not system trials, so they don't have all the stuff you have in drug court. Some of the patients may or may not, you know, show up at a council who may be good or may not. So so there is an awful lot of evidence to suggest that, meth meth that uh, methamphetamine can be successfully treated with extended release Vivitrol, and we do that, and uh, we see very few relapses. You know, here you guys can say, what do you mean? They're relapsing like flies. We see very few relapses, and when they do relapse, it tends to be a much shorter controlled relapse. Please. Can you explain to me why it works on both, on both opiates, and I, you guys use it for alcohol also, mm -hmm. and meth? Did I miss that? Did you talk no, about no, that? No, you didn't. You're just, you're just right. Okay. The brain receptors for alcohol, for methamphetamine, and for um, opioids are very similar. Okay. So a receptor blocker, like naltrexone, okay. uh, buprenorphine is a receptor blocker too, but it's a little narrower in its scope. Um, naltrexone is a little wider in its, in its action, so, and the receptors are similar. So it blocks those receptors. Okay. No, it doesn't block cocaine receptors. It doesn't block cannabis receptors. Okay. You know, what can it's you like do? A, it's not a complete it, miracle. Yeah. But at least it blocks these big three. Well, I suppose this is just kind of going through a little bit of how we go about it. Um, and there it goes back to the beginning of the discussion. It's a medication of choice for relapse prevention, unless it's a contraindication to doing it. We also want to point out, again, it's not substance specific. So when I know that if you're going to control the meth use, you're going to go through it, or vice versa, when we have a med that might be broader, well, then I'll go to cocaine or cannabis, but what can you do? Um, maybe not, though. Maybe, maybe, they'll, maybe we'll intervene here, cut into these, or get 18 months, two years. So, so many people tell me that they didn't want to get treated in the beginning. Now that they've got a decent job, a car, a decent place to live, and their kids back, maybe treatment wasn't such a bad idea. <laughs> so, so you do begin to get the weight of inertia in a positive lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So maybe they won't jump to the fourth or fifth one. We do this slowly. Somebody has to be off opioids for 10 days. Got to be confirmed by your analysis. Your analysis, you know, for drug, we usually have a cutoff. Let's say we can't detect it below such and such. 
So once it's negative, we want to wait another day anyway. And then we'll give them a small dose of oral naltrexone to make sure that they have no adverse reaction to that. So we're trying as hard as we can to prevent adverse reactions, pick up stuff early. 25 milligrams, if they have a bad response, they'll be over in two hours. If you give them the injection, we can't take it out. So we try to go along this carefully. And then what do you hope? Some, some patients are pretty, are, they're high risk patients, they haven't been a year. They've, they've recently gone into a program and having difficulties. They say they're fighting cravings every day. So we'll put them on oral naltrexone, which has some efficacy, scientifically based, not as much as the injection, but some, to try to hold them over until their first injection day. And last is that we want to know that patients want to like to do this forever, not do this a lifetime. That's, that's be a hard sell. Um, we should know. Um, we try to work off the idea that it's two to three years of, of successful um, abstinence. So we recommend that the IM, the strongest part of this, be done for a year. If everything goes well, we use a hundred milligrams of naltrexone. Fifty is what they use in the study. If everything goes well, third year we'll drop it down to fifty. So it gives people an idea. <coughs> Every patient the same? No, because some patients reach their 12 months and say, you know, I think I should stay on this longer. And some people come off and say, you know, I think I should go back to it. And sometimes the court or the team or the judge thinks that the patient should be on for longer, which is fine with me. Mm -hmm. Please. Are you able to talk about what kind of medication to pay for this for methamphetamine users? Are they willing to go along with this? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that just a tiny bit. The answer is still yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who may be in court, or my office otherwise, mm -hmm. with methamphetamine as their uh, immediate primary concern, also use alcohol arguments. Mm -hmm. So you're sending it through, they don't ask what percentage of the use is what. So alcohol use disorder, opiate use disorder, substance use disorder, I mean, stimulant use disorder, they're all true. So that's number one. The second part, though, is when you say, you know, this patient just doesn't have any of these. We're not going to go so far as to pretend. One time Medicaid is great. You see, if it's a court or legal thing, they can approve it. It may not be great with other things, but they're great with this. Um, also, we probably have the single largest group of patients. And they, they, they look at their data. They see that they're getting tapered. They see that they're getting off. They see that they're not going to New York. So they're very cooperative. Um, when it's not a court issue or a legal issue or anything, that's what sometimes they say, well, you start the naltrexone. I say, yeah, I turned around on it, I turned it on fair play. What do you mean start the naltrexone? First of all, it's um, not FDA approved. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, what do you mean fail or naltrexone? I don't know what does. What exactly do you mean by fail? Yeah. So more well, often than not, we can do okay. And we can't occurrence. Um, they're very generous in giving the samples mm -hmm. to get people started and uh, with one way or another. Everything. Thank you. You're welcome. I do believe it's question time. And I think I hit this right. Like it, it, five more minutes. It, mm -hmm. What do you think? So um, do you detect that there's a lot of inaccuracy in reporting by patients to you about the nature of their use and the extent of it, and how much trouble does that cause you? And is there anything that we can do in referring people to you that might help with that? We think about that a lot. You know how credible? How credible is a witness, right? <laughs> how credible is a witness? A lot of times, not very credible. But you get there because you. you you have the you have the urine tests. You, you uh, or we use saliva actually more than anything. So you've got the drug tests. So they may say that they're they haven't relapsed. They're perfect. The other part of a lot of their credibility is we're, we're talking to the same people. You know, they're talking to the same people you are too, and, and you you get a you get a sense of what's more or less believable. And a lot of times we find people being untruthful to us when they're in trouble and they don't want to admit it. I think this is your question. So we have somebody 
doing well on um, buprenorphine for opioid. And this guy, this particular guy, has been doing well for years. Misses a visit. We, we, that doesn't sit well with us because it, it's an internet visit. Nobody's asked you to drive four hours on a blizzard. So it always makes us worry that there's something else happening. Sometimes there's not. They miss a visit, they make a second visit, they don't take the drug tests. Mm -hmm. Well, finally you get the guy to do it, but he's still clear on opioids, still shows the buprenorphine, but shows some meth. And they don't go to the visits, and they don't take the drug test, because they're afraid they're going to get kicked out of the program. And you know, that's what people used to do, or maybe still do. I'm not necessarily a court program, I think you understand better, mm -hmm. but on some of the some of the community programs, you know, they fail you away, they're out of there. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're taking that as an indication that you don't care, you're not serious, you're what, whatever. And so the, the, the credibility is um, always an interesting issue. And, and yes, they're not always truthful. And when you say, what are we going to do? You have to make a decision on some of these people, right? I, I, I'd rather let a few slip through the lie to me than, than deny appropriate treatment to a a much greater number that are in trouble. I guess it's the same innocent until proven guilty, right? Some of them are going to lie, so they're going to beat us for a prescription one time. Mm -hmm. And then that's an acceptable cost to me. Well, and I think one of the things that helps with that, what you just asked, is um, when I send patients, um, when we have new inductions and I send Matt the information, I give him some collateral information as well as um, their CD assessment, right? So that way he's got that information in front of whoever's going to see them and ask the pointed questions, right? Like, because I think they don't know exactly what, they don't even remember doing an assessment, let alone what they told the assessor. Mm -hmm. So I think that uncovers a lot, and there's a lot of discrepancies that... Thank you for adding that, mm -hmm. because we depend heavily on the CD mm -hmm. and, and any other documents we can get, you know, court, probation, parole, because they want to take it from that perspective. If it's a new person just came in off the street, you're not going to believe 10% of what they tell you because that's the nature of things. Um, we, don't, we almost never see a patient without those documents anymore because it used to be we would get people hyper-acute, they'd come in from somewhere, we'd get them stabilized, and you'd never see them again. I had two kids, 14 and 16. I knew the mother of one. We'd get them off the street, put them in the hospital, straighten them out. The next day, they woke up in again. The day after that, they're eating pizza, and then they go out the window. Uh -huh. Those four hospital rooms. Uh -huh. You know, I said, guys, you couldn't come out the door. Right. But unless somebody's sort of in a system where they're gonna, will we'll, we'll know that they're part of uh, some behavior with health counseling, court, probation, parole, something. It, it tends to, to not work out as well, and you know, we have more patients than spots, so we want to gather up as much history as we can. Sometimes it's helpful too if your treatment provider can put together a group where the, the MAP patients are in there together like a support group and then they'll oftentimes share some things and have their peers encourage them to be more open or honest if they're having a struggle. It, it, it takes time and you see, you see more trust develop. I hardly ever challenge them about anything for the first few visits. I can wait. And then we're, we're uh, we're strong in mental health because many of the, if it's a counseling organization, they're doing counseling. You've got your people going to LACs, you know, like they, within the treatment organizations, to have an LAC present is usually the case. Mm -hmm. To have mental health present is less usually the mm -hmm. case. So a very high percentage of our people um, also work with mental health people. And what I wish we had more of was um, I promise specialists because the stories, especially one of my more recent patients started using me as 11. Before that, the record was 14. These kids, are, you know, give them whatever drug you want, that's not going to cure it. Mm -hmm. I, I wish we had more of those resources. Mm. Do we do, we, do, do the, did I do the job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you pair well fusion ever with the you know, naltrexone for methamphetamine? So we can go back to some older studies that suggested any number of different drugs, including Wellbutrin, uh, um, 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 Wellbutrin, um, Naltrexone. They were thought to have 
um, suggested possible effects. You know, several dozens of drugs that they almost try and ran gabapentin and other drugs. And, and so there are studies in the field combining Wellbutrin and Deltrexone. And they are showing some effect and not much. Actually, the most recent one, I don't remember the numbers, it wasn't terrible, there was some effect, but it didn't come up to having the effect of the uh, injected Deltrexone. You have more of a comment, Dr. Ryder. It's, it's been frustration that I've shared with Matthew Palmer and other providers about getting supplicate and approved for through different insurances and, and the length of time that it takes that to get approved and delivered, oftentimes creating a gap in, in care uh, for some of those participants. And just wondering if there's any sort of inroads that you can identify or maybe collaborations and advocacy through different treatment courts around the state to talk with some of those insurance providers to get more quicker approval for that specific drug. You know, I'm not, I'm not immediately, I, I know what you're talking about. I'm not immediately thinking about a mechanism um, for, for the private payers. There, there are fewer private payers, I think, overall on our addiction practice than there are uh, Medicare and Medicaid payers, so we don't encounter the problem quite as often. The company so that, that makes Sublocate uh, has a division that's supposed to help get approval, and they do. They are helpful. But this is the occasional insurance company. I do believe it's one of your patients, uh, or two where they keep sending us letters saying that they don't cover court-ordered therapy. Right. And we keep writing back and saying it's not court-ordered therapy. Right. Right? It just yeah. it isn't. There's no court order from a judge to have this therapy. It's just a recommended part of a drug program mm -hmm. that everybody else does too. And there I almost wonder, you know, the judge doesn't have two, three hours to write that letter back to them any more than I do. Right. Sometimes I wonder whether or not, since we have a fairly high level of authority there with the, with the, uh, with the judge, that some of them might not just attack those people. Mm -hmm. um, but if that'll help or not, I don't quite know. But if it's the judge saying there's no court order and copies that to the insurance commissioner, but it's not easy. It's, it's not easy to take the time to do that. Sure. Uh, Alkermes does better with Vivitrol than, I can't remember who makes Supplicate, Alkermes is more helpful with Vivitrol than the Sublocate people are, probably because it's a bigger market. Right. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.